I want to begin with the foundations of a husband and a wife and a family. The secular world, the other religions don't have a good foundation for the family. Our country is moving more and more towards atheism, and so is all of Europe. I don't know if you know it, but France has some of the most beautiful churches in the whole world, but they're empty. Nobody's there anymore. Very few people come to those churches. Italy has more people that are still faithful to the church. But Europe, the Holland and the Netherlands, most of those countries are becoming atheistic. They're becoming secular. They're becoming self-centered. They're losing the faith almost completely. United States, we still have Christianity. But many of us, many are going towards atheism. And the churches are being emptied in some areas. But I have to say there's good news because in places like Texas, there's one city named Austin where they're building 15 new churches because so many new Catholics are coming and so many people are converting to Catholic faith. But overall, the secular world doesn't have a foundation for where the family comes from or ideas. And everything for us as Christians ties back to God. God is the source of everything. And when we look at the family, we realize that God is the source of the family. He's what, he created the family for a purpose, and it reflects the Trinity. He made us in his image, God did. He created us male and female in his image. And it's to reflect the Trinity, because in the Trinity, you have the Father and the Son. They love each other. And from the Father and the Son comes the Holy Spirit. And from that relationship of those three, there's a great love. There's a community. It's a family. And then he made us male and female. And the male and the female love each other, and out comes the children. And it's a relationship of love. And the whole idea is that God made us in his image, not just the individual, but the family is made in his image. The family is made in the image of the Trinity with three people that love each other and care. The book of Genesis starts with, in the beginning, God existed before anything else. Before his physical creation, he created everything from nothing. And God created us and the family in his image. And there's a huge difference between the Catholic view, the Christian view of the family, than any other view that has any other religion or atheism or any other uh, philosophy has about the family. Christian Catholic view is rich, it's beautiful, and it's fulfilling. Now, one of the things our family, I, my family, and Janet and I have always said is that the family is a great work of art. What do I mean by that? A lot of people just get married and they think it's going to happen. They don't have to work at it. It's just going to be there. Kids will come along, they'll grow up and be raised, and you don't have to think about it. But I always have thought that the family is like a great masterpiece of art, something that takes a long time to work at. You know, when Rembrandt was painting or Michelangelo was painting, it took a long time to paint the Sistine Chapel. And if he made a mistake, he went back and fixed it. And this is what the family is. It's a great artwork. It takes a whole lifetime for this masterpiece of our families. But I hope someday to see my family hanging in the hall of fame in heaven and have God you see, look at that family, look what they did, look at that family, what they did. So think of this as your family as a work of art that someday will be there in heaven for all to see that you did it the God's way and that your, God is proud of you for it. In the beginning, it says in Genesis, God created man in his image, in the divine image he created man. Male and female. In other words, the image of God is not just on the man. A man alone is in the image of God, but not completely. The image of God is reflected in man and woman together. Male and female together are the image of God. And God multiplied them and said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it have dominion over the earth. So when God created Adam and Eve, he didn't create them to just be selfish, but he created them with a task, a job. Even before sin came into the world, even before there was the fall of mankind where sin came in and ruined everything, before that time, we were supposed to be man and woman in the image of God, raising children and subduing the earth. Our job was to take the Garden of Eden and tend it and take care of it and expand the boundaries and keep it going until it covered the whole earth. And we were to have lots of children 
Our, our culture today treats children as a disease. It's considered a health care thing. You, ha you can go, uh, getting abortions and contraceptions is all part of health care, as though having a baby is a disease. Having a baby isn't a disease. It's a great blessing from God. God gives us the ability to, ha to have children. I talked to the young people. Yeah, I don't know if any of them are here, but in the end, they, they were sitting also the boys on one side and the girls on the other. And I said to the girls, I said, God has made you very special, something you can do that none of us guys can do. You can bring a new human life into the world. You are very special. We can't do that, but you can do that. And I told the girls there, don't ever become a boy toy for the boys. You are not to be played with. You are not to be used. You are a special gift of God. You are a princess. And don't ever let anybody treat you other than a princess because that's the way God created you. And the males, the men, are supposed to take care of the women. The husband is supposed to take care of the wife and love her and protect her. And between the two of them, to have children and be raised as a family. The catechism says... The family is the original cell of social life. Husband and wife are called to give themselves in love to each other and from that love to bring about the gift of life, which is children. The life of relationships within the family provides the foundations for everything else in society. The family is the most important thing. So you can see why the devil would love to destroy the family because it's the foundation of society, it's the foundation of the church, it's the foundation of everything we know as human beings. If you can destroy the family, you can destroy humanity. If you can redefine marriage is another issue, and that's what we're doing in our country. We're redefining what marriage is. And if you can redefine it to say that it's not a man and a woman forever, then what you have is you can have chaos and there's no longer order in society. And our country, unfortunately, is trying to export this to every other country. Marriage is more than just a relationship between peoples. Marriage is more than just a husband and wife living together. I learned, and I didn't learn this until I became a Catholic, that a marriage is a sacrament. It's a matrimony. It's a covenant made between a man and a woman. Even when I was an evangelical Protestant, we heard, we were told that it's just a contract. And if after a while the contract doesn't work out, you can divorce and marry someone else. And in evangelical Protestants, they're getting divorced as much as anybody else. And unfortunately, too many Catholics don't understand what a sacrament is and the covenant of marriage. And they're also getting divorces and remarrying in other parts of the world. But the fact is, is that marriage is a sacrament. It is a gift from God, and God is in charge of marriage. That's why the sacrament of marriage is handled by the church. That's why a marriage is valid when it's done by a priest in a church. But you know, when Martin Luther came along, he didn't want seven sacraments. He said, we're only going to have two sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper. And he changed those into being something other than they were. And he said, we will no longer be in charge of marriage. We will give that to the state, to the government. And so Martin Luther denied that marriage was a sacrament under the control of the church created by God. And he said, just give it to the state. And when he did that, the Protestants lost control over marriage. It's no longer to them a sacrament. It is now just an agreement between persons, and it's in the state or the government is in charge of it no longer than the church. The Catholic church is much different. Now, between a husband and a wife, when God created man, he said, he brought all the animals, giraffes and hippopotamuses and lions, and Adam named them all. But all of the animals had a mate, a male and a female lion, a male and a female hippopotamus. And then Adam, when they all went by and he named them, they walked away. Adam said, I didn't find anything for me, no mate for me. And God said, it's not good that man is alone. I will create for him a helpmate. And he put Adam to sleep, it says in the book of Genesis. And he put him to sleep in a garden. 
and he cut open his side and he took out part of his body, a rib, and from that he fashioned a woman right from the side of Adam. And he created the woman and Adam woke up and he loved his wife and said, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman. And he fell in love. It's the first poetry ever written. It was Adam falling in love with Eve in the garden. You know, I just want to take a step back. You know, that is a picture of Jesus, by the way. Did you ever think about that? When Jesus went to the cross, God the Father brought his son Jesus to the earth. And Jesus was in a garden. Do you know that the cross where Jesus was crucified was in a garden, just like Adam was in a garden? And God wanted his son Jesus to have a bride, just like Adam had a bride. How did Adam get his bride? God put him to sleep in a garden, cut open his side, took part of his body out and fashioned it into a bride. And then Adam loved his bride and married her. In the Bible, it's the same with Jesus because what happened with Jesus is God, his father took him into a garden and he put Jesus to sleep on the cross and remember the lance cut open Jesus' side and God took what came out, the blood and the water, which represent Eucharist and baptism and from that he created the church. And when Jesus woke up, the church became his bride and just like Adam fell in love with Eve, Jesus fell in love with his bride in the garden. And Jesus loves his bride, which is us. The Father and the, from the Father and the Son, and the love that they have for one another, the teaching of the Trinity, is that for all of eternity, God and the Father and the Son were there and they loved one another and their love was so palpable and it was so real that that love became the person of the Holy Spirit. It wasn't that it happened sometime in the past, but it was an eternal thing. Forever and ever, for all of eternity, the Father and the Son loved each other and, from the Holy, and then the Holy Spirit was there and the three persons loved one another and that's how they fashioned the family so that the husband loves his wife and takes her into his home and they love one another and they become one. And the love that they have together brings children. And now you have more than two. You have a family, which is a picture of the Trinity and that's the way God wanted it to be. He created it this way because it's beautiful. He created it this way because it's a great loving relationship. Nobody needs to be lonely. They have their own husband, their own wife and their family. Now there are many who are single. And that's okay. That's part of the plan. I don't know how a priest does it. When I see a priest and he's single, I said, you're a good man because I couldn't do that, Father. I'm glad you got the gift because I sure don't have that gift. But I told my children as they grew up that the normal plan for God was for a man and a woman to marry. But God had special gifts sometimes for certain people. And so that even though the normal plan is for you to get married someday, to find the, white bride, the right wife and marry her, even though that's God's plan, always be open while you're still single to the fact that God may want you to be a priest. He may want to call you to be a religious sister and that's good, but maybe he won't call you then, and then the plan is to be married. And there are some people who stay single for the Lord. Remember St. Paul, he didn't get married. St. Paul was on a mission. He was on a mission to save the world, to preach the gospel, and he said, if I got married, it would slow me down. I would be committed to taking care of my wife, and I wouldn't be able to work so hard. So St. Paul, he stayed single so that he could serve the Lord. And there are those who stay single, both men and women, who decide to stay single so that they can serve the Lord with all of their attention and all of their heart. And that's okay, too. The church has a place for that. The family is so important that I always think about the fact that when we're on our deathbed, we're not going to say, I wish I had watched more television. My big regret is I didn't make more money. My big regret is I didn't play more sports. What are we going to say on our deathbed, all of us? I'm going to say two things. I wish I'd have spent more time with the Lord. I wish I'd have prayed more, worshipped more, 
I wish I'd have read my Bible more. And the second thing I'm going to say is I wish I'd have spent more time with my family, with my sons and my daughters, and loving my wife or my husband. On the deathbed, we don't care how much money we made. We don't care about all those things, but we care about the people we love. God, the Father, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, Mary, with those people, but also those in our family who we love. I remember my father died, and he was the best man, I think, in the world, in my eyes anyway. And my dad had no regrets. When my father died, he didn't have any regrets because he had always put Jesus first in his life. And even at the end of his life as he was dying, he said to me when he was old, he said, Steve, I can't wait for the Lord to come and take me home. He died at 94 years old. His joints were all creak, creak. They were all squeaky now. He couldn't walk very well, couldn't see very well. He was forgetting things. He was wetting his pants. And he said, I can't wait to get to heaven and be with the Lord who shed his blood for me when I get a brand new body and I'll be like brand new again. Our family was not very wealthy. We didn't have a lot of money because my dad turned down promotions at Ford Motor Company so he could spend more time with us boys and with his wife. And my dad loved my mother. The most important thing a father can do for his children. Remember this, men. There's nothing you can do for your children that is more important than to love their mother. To love their mother and take good care of her is the most important thing you can do for children. And my dad did that with no regrets because he took the family as very, very important. I'll just tell you a story about my dad when he, when he died. He wasn't a Catholic. And right before he was dying while he was still awake, I wanted a priest to come in and give him last rites with the oil. And the priest said, we can't do that because that's only for Catholics. I said, but my dad is going unconscious. I think he already is a Catholic now because he's starting to see what's up there. And even though he's not always awake, I think he's, and the priest came in and blessed my dad and he woke up and he said, thank you to the priest for doing that. And my dad, when he died, they took him to the funeral home and it was full of people, about as many as there are here. And there was not room in the funeral home for my, all those people. My dad was in, in, in the coffin and there, people were in the hallways and standing out in the lobbies. There weren't even places to park all the cars. And I had a chance to talk at my dad's funeral because he was such a good father and a good example of being a father to me. And I said to everybody, you are all here because you loved my dad. Because my dad was very Christ-like. He was just like Jesus. And you all loved him because of that. And I said, I'll tell you why you loved him. Because if my dad had not had a change in his life, you wouldn't like him. Because my dad used to drink too much. He used to smoke too much. He used to run around. And he was kind of a wild guy. But, but when my dad became a Christian, it changed him and healed him. He never drank again. He never smoked again. He never ran around again. He became a very good husband and a very good father. That's what Jesus can do for you, by the way. And I said, and I have this little card because I still have my dad's Bible that he had. And it's all marked up and underlined and notated because my dad loved the Bible. And inside I found a little card that says, I, Charles Ray, believe that Jesus Christ died for my sins. He saved me from hell and I'm going to heaven. And there's a little statement of his testimony for Jesus Christ. And I held that up for everybody at the funeral home. And I said, the reason you loved my father is because my father loved Jesus. You loved him because Jesus changed him. And when my dad died, all those people were there to say goodbye to him. But he had no regrets. Marriage is a vocation. It's something God created us for. It's not just something that we decide to do, but it's something God created us for. And it's being a husband and a wife. I view husband and wife as many things. I tell my wife all the time, we're covenant partners. She likes it when I say that because what I'm saying to her is, you're stuck with me for the rest of your life. She said, I like being stuck with you. I'm not going to leave you. I'm glad you're not going to leave me. I'm not going to leave you either because we're covenant partners. It's a covenant that we have. Two become one. 
That's what the Bible says, that the two people become one. And when you really get to know your wife or husband and love them, you start to feel that way. I don't even like to be separated from my wife. That's why she comes with me on all these things. I also tell her she's my lover. I don't have to go out and look at television and pornography to find a lover. I have a lover. I don't have to go find another. And she says the same. You know, men, I know women, this isn't an issue, but for men, the world has a lot of pornography now. And it's very easy to look at pornography and to start thinking of those girls in the movies as being lovers or substitute lovers and being excited about them. Nothing can destroy marriages faster than pornography. If anybody's watching that, get rid of it. Stay away from it. It'll destroy your soul. This is the way I view my wife. This is the way we view our relationship, that we do everything together. We do it as a team. It's a lifetime project. It takes planning. It takes effort. You have to work at it. And there's no schools to train you. Isn't that funny? You can get a driver's license. You have to take classes. Do you do that in India? Do you have to take classes to get a driver's license? And you get tested? And if you fail the test, you have to do it again, and you don't get your driver's license? Did you have to take classes and have a test to get married? Only in the church there's some classes. Marriage is so important. It's, e it's, easier to get a driver it's easier to get married sometimes than it is to get a driver's license. And yet what's more important than being married and having a family together? The foundation of a family have to be strong. You can't just assume that your wife is always going to love you. I wake up every morning with this thought on my mind. It's not a bad idea, guys, to think this. I can't assume that my wife is going to love me today. What am I going to do to win her love again today? Would you let wives like that if your husband thought that every morning when he woke up? What am I going to do to win my wife's love again today? How am I going to treat her? How am I going to respect her? What am I going to do for her to make her love me today? I think you'd all like that. But wouldn't you guys like it if your wife thought that as well? Sometimes that means, you know, when you guys are dating your girlfriends, you'd brush your teeth, you'd comb your hair, put a little cologne on. Then we get married and we forget to do that. We take our wives for granted. You remember, the, did you ever see the movie Fiddler on the Roof? And Tavia, who was the old man, in one of the songs, I like this, he sings to his wife, do you love me? Do you love me? And she said, of course, I, change, I wash your clothes, I cook your food, I clean your house, I raise your kids. He said, I know you do those things, but do you love me? We get to the point sometime in a relationship that we do our duties. We do what we're supposed to do. You cook, you clean, you take care of the kids, you go out and work, you bring home the money, you take care of a few things. And of course, I love you, don't I? I go out to work for you every day. But the wife has the right to sing to you when you come home. But do you still love me? I know you go to work for me. I know you do those things. But do you love me? Love is something between a husband and a wife that has to be worked at. It's something that has to be practiced. You can't just assume it's going to be there 20 years from now. You know, every once in a while, I surprise my wife with flowers. I don't give her flowers on her birthday because she expects them. I give her flowers on a day that's nothing so it's a surprise. One time I came home, you gotta keep the romance in marriage, and one time I came home, I had to rent a tuxedo for my daughter's wedding, and I still had an extra day before I had to take the tuxedo home. So that night I surprised my wife. I told her to go up to the bedroom and don't come down until I call you, and I put on the tuxedo. I put flowers on the table. I cooked her her favorite meal. I sent the other kids away. Nothing to destroy romance like kids in the room. <laughs> Sometimes it's good to send them to their cousin's house or something. And then I said, you can come down. And she came down, and there I was in the tuxedo, and I says, Madam, I love you, and I'm here to serve you today. Please have a seat. And I poured her her wine. I gave her this beautiful meal that she loved. And oh, my goodness, was there rewards for that?
It's a good idea, men, to romance your wife. Did you ever romance her when you were dating her? You did. Do you romance her now that you're married? Uh, maybe sometimes. Another thing I did for my wife, you're going to think it's just because I'm a crazy American, but that maybe is the case, but it doesn't hurt. One day, I planned ahead, and I had all the kids out of the house. I sent them to stay with their cousins. I'm just giving you some ideas. Are you girl, don't, you shouldn't listen to this part. I'm just talking to these guys. And I bought a bunch of rose petals. And I got up early in the morning and I made her favorite breakfast and put it on a tray. I took the rose petals while she's still sound asleep and I sprinkled them from her bed all the way into the bathtub. I put, you know, bubbly, uh, a bubble bath, you know this? They know. Do you guys know what a bubble bath is? They do. Anyway, so I made a bubble bath and I wrote her a poem about how much I loved her. I wrote her a poem. I know I'm not a very good poet, but she thought it was really good. If you write them a poem, no matter how bad it is, they're going to love it. So, and I put it inside of a bottle, and I put a cork in the bottle, and I put it in the bathtub so it's floating in the bubbles. Then I went and I woke her up. And I said, good morning, dear. She said, good morning. What are you up to? She says, you have a funny smile on your face. I said, today is your day. What do you mean, smile? What are those flowers on the floor? I said, follow the flowers, but only in a minute. I brought the tray up with her breakfast and strawberries and blueberries and all her favorite things. Where's the kids? I got to feed the kids. Oh, no, you don't. I sent the kids away. I said, you enjoy your breakfast, and I'm here to serve you today. And when you're done eating, follow the rose petals. So she ate really fast because she wanted to know where the rose petals went. She was excited, so she followed the rose petals. And there in the bathtub was all that warm water with the bubbles. And she got into the bathtub, and I said, I'll be downstairs cleaning the house. When you are done, call me. So she went in, and she said, wait, what's this? And she opened and read the poem. And she stayed in the bathtub for about an hour, and then she came down. The house was all clean for her. I cleaned it for her. And then we spent the day together. Now, see, I don't assume... Thank you. I think the women will clap more if you do this. But I, I look at my family and my wife as a project still in development. I don't view it as something that's done. I got married to her now. I don't care how much I don't shave and I don't brush my teeth and put cologne on or take a shower anymore. Doesn't matter because I'm already married to you. No. I want her to love me. I want to have a beautiful relationship. I want her to be my best friend. I want her to, do you love me? Yes, I love you. I want it this way. And do you know how much nicer a marriage is if you work at it and you have this relationship? How much more peaceful it is? And then my wife, she does things like that for me too, but that's private. I'm not going to tell you what she does for me. <laughs> but we do these fun things. I'll tell you one more. We, used to, we would go for a walk around the block. It was a, a one mile, one mile, one mile. So it, was, it took about an hour or so to walk. And one day I got another idea that I'm going to write her a poem in four parts. And I wrote it and put it in an envelope, the first part, and I went out in the car and I pinned it to a tree. And then in the next mile, I pinned another part of the poem to a tree and another one and another one. So it's four parts. And then we went for a walk. And as we're walking along, she sees the envelope pinned to the tree. And she said, what's that? I said, I don't know. Maybe you should go check it out. She opens it up and it's a poem for her. And it says at the bottom, to be continued. She couldn't wait to keep walking. She's looking at all the trees like this. Oh, there's another one. And she ran over and she got it. Part two, to be continued. Well, to make a long story short, it was a very nice day because she knows that I love her and I took the time to think about her. Even in the busyness of our life, raising kids with careers and jobs and homes and problems and family members and brothers and sisters and all of that, take time to love each other. We had a rule in our family. No matter how busy we were, no matter how consumed we were with kids and nappies and everything else, every week we would go on a date together. One night a week was our date night. And we would go out together even if we just walked around the block holding hands together. 
Every week, I let her know, even when we're raising our kids, you're so special that I want to have one day alone just with you. One hour even sometimes where we would spend together. But then kids come along. You know, when you get married, it's all romance and it's all fun and you're just alone together. But then kids come along and they mess up everything. <laughs> In a good way, but I, it's true. There's a couple, some young people getting married. You know, I, I am so glad all my kids are grown up and married. And they call it the empty nest syndrome. Have you ever heard of that? The empty nest syndrome, as though it's a bad thing. It's not. It's lovely when the kids grow up and move out. It's just my wife and I now. I love it. But we have them over to our house all the time. Grandchildren come over. We have 12, and it's very nice to be with them. But we, I remember when the kids came along, it changed everything. It was much more difficult to be romantic with each other. It was much more difficult to find time to be together. And I used to get jealous thinking that my wife cared more about the kids than she did me. You're always with them. You're changing diapers. You don't talk to me anymore. You know. But then my wife, we, we worked it out because we always talked about things together. We would spend an hour or two when we're on our dates or weeks talking about how we can raise our family better. We're always discussing and talking about that. You know, statistics in, in the United States, and I don't know about the rest of the world about here, but there's, the family is falling apart. There are songs being sung like, I don't feel the love anymore. It's a song about why a husband is leaving his wife because he doesn't feel the love anymore. Do you have to feel the love? I'm talking about romance together, but what if there's a time where you're both very busy and there isn't a lot of romance? Do you then just say, well, I don't f feel like I did when I was a teenager about you. When you're a teenager and you first start dating one another, my goodness, your heart's going <laughs> like this. You can't think about anything else than that beautiful girl or that handsome man. Then you get married and that feeling goes away. It comes back now and then. But a marriage and a relationship is not based on that feeling of a heart fluttering like this and feeling all emotional about. The love in a marriage is called agape love. It's the kind of love God has for us. It's a commitment. It's a covenant. It is unconditional. My wife knows tomorrow that if she gets in a car accident and loses both of her legs and she has to go around in a wheelchair, that I am committed to her 100% with the same kind of love that God has for her non-conditional. I will push her around in a wheelchair the rest of my life. I won't say to her, oh, but you're not the woman I married. When I married you, you had two legs and you were young and beautiful. You're not anymore and I don't feel the love for you anymore. I'm going to trade you in for a younger model. My wife knows I'm not going to do that because I am a Catholic and I am committed to marriage as a sacrament and that I will love her until death do us part. And it's a great security for me to know that she is the same way, that she'll do the same thing. It's the real kind of love is agape love, it's called. That's the Greek word, which means that is unconditional no matter what, I will love you. I will take care of you. But it is nice to keep the romance alive, too, even though it's a commitment. It can be much more than that if we keep the romance alive. I see a husband and a wife relationship and a family in another way as well. I view it as a holiness factory. It's a place where we practice holiness. If a person lives by themselves, they can be selfish and they can be greedy and self-centered. But when you live with a spouse, you have to sacrifice. You have to compromise. It says, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. How do you sharpen a knife? By rubbing it against something, right? You rub it and you rub it and it sharpens things. Guess how God makes us holy? Guess how he sharpens us? By putting us with someone and they rub on us and they rub on us and they rub on us every day and we become more compliant. We become more holy. I see my wife as there to help me become a saint. She points out the things that I do wrong. She doesn't do it critically. But she helps me to be better because I have to be less selfish. 
I have to be thinking of her. And when I'm thinking of her all the time, remember it says, Jesus said that as Christ loved the, the church, so you should, a husband should love his wife like Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? By giving his life for her. How can we as husbands love our wives as the way Christ loved the church? We have to lay our life down for our wives. We talk about a wife submitting to her husband. I'm the head of the house. You have to obey me. I'm the head of the house. You don't have to say that to a wife if you're laying your life down for her every day. If your husband's laid their lives down for you every day, does he have to tell you to obey me, follow me? Or would you do it out of love because he's giving his life to you every day? It makes you want to love him. It makes you want to help him. So the family is a holiness factory. It's a factory where we make saints. And then when children come along, it's even more so because you don't have much time for yourself anymore. You don't have a lot of time to be selfish anymore. You're right in front of your favorite TV show and the kid gets sick and you have to go help the kid. This is where you learn self-sacrifice. You give up your life for your wife and your family. So think of the family as a place where saints are made. And is it important to make saints? Yes, because in heaven, there are only saints. If you want to be in heaven with Jesus for eternity, it is required that you become a saint. And the family is a beautiful way for each of us in the family to help each other to become saints. When we have children, I want to just discuss children anymore, a little bit. As our kids grew up, things changed. We had to learn how to discipline them, what we needed to do for the kids. And it's, very, it's important because, I don't know about here, but in the United States, I know they always say the three things that ruin marriages are money, problems with money, sex, and children. Those three things can cause a family to break up if they're not handled right. Money, money problems, not enough money, causing issues of debt, making their tension and arguing and fighting, sex issues between a husband and a wife, and having children and how to raise children. Those three things are the biggest problems in a marriage. So my wife and I used to sit and talk about those three things. We'd get good books to read about them. We would discuss them. Knowing they were problems, we would discuss them. And one of them was children. Children can be very disruptive in a family. Husbands, you are the head of the homes. You should be the disciplinarians with the children. You're the ones that should discipline and raise them and teach them. And when they need to be brought up short and put in a chair for a while or even given a spanking, it's the father who should do that. Don't leave that up to the wife. The wife should be the nurturer of the family. I remember when we had our kids, I told my kids, you never say no to your mother. Don't ever let me hear you raise your voice to your mother. Don't ever say no or disobey her because she is my princess and you will respect her. And if you don't respect her, I'm coming after you. My kids to this day adore their mother. They still treat her like a princess. They won't yell at their mother. They will obey her even now when they're in their 30s. One got a daughter who's almost 40. She still adores her mother. I said to my kids, I was raised, with, I was living with this girl, and I, always, I still call my wife my girlfriend all the time. Even my grandkids say, where's your girlfriend? Because <laughs> they know my wife is my girlfriend. And I said to my kids as they were growing up, this is my girlfriend. And we lived together long before you got here. And we're going to be living together long after you're gone. And if you think you're going to come into our family and disrupt that, you got another thing coming. Well, Dad, you love Mom more than you do us, don't you? You're darn right I do. Of course I love your mother more. We've been together before you came along, and we're going to be together after you're gone. I love you. You're my kids. But don't ever think that I don't love Mom. We're one. We're a covenant partner. We're one. God made us to be one. So we would sit up, my wife and I, and discuss and plan how we're going to raise our family, how we're going to deal with the kids. We used to put the rules on the refrigerator so that the kids would know the rules. And we had rules. I disciplined the kids. I did not let them go crazy in the home. 
There's nothing that can make it difficult for a husband and a wife to love each other and have a nice home as if kids are undisciplined, screaming all the time, thinking they're selfish, disobedient. That's when a husband has to take the child and sit down with them and say, look it, we need to get this straightened out. We need, you have to become under control. Nobody's going to be perfect, but at least I think within a family, the father has to keep the control of the family and it makes it much better. Parents also must have a united front. You know what I mean by that? Sometimes a kid will go to the dad and say, Dad, can I go uh, out and do such and such? And he says, no, not today. So the kid's smart. He goes to mom and says, Mom, can I go out and do something today? And the mom says, okay, go ahead. Not knowing that the dad already said no. And the kid's out the door and goes. I always said, and our, my wife always said too, if they came and said, can we do this? I said, have you already asked your mother? <laughs> yes. What did she say? No. Then why did you come and ask me? You know mom and I are going to stick together. You think you're going to get us apart? You think you're going to get your mom and I fighting about whether you can go out tonight or not? If she says no, it's no. Then the kids always knew that you couldn't work mom against dad or work dad against mom. Talk to each other. Plan together. Make sure that that happens. I just close with a couple of thoughts. When we started raising children, so I said to my wife, I want to raise rebels. I have a talk I, I give in the United States called Raising Rebels. I want my children to rebel against the ungodly culture that's out there. I want my children to be godly children. I want them to put Jesus Christ first in their life. I want them to get married and stay married for a lifetime like my wife and I do. And in order to do that, you have to go against the stream. You have to swim upstream. You can't float with the stream of culture. Only dead things float with the water down. Living things swim upstream. A salmon can only reproduce if he swims upstream, upstream, and it's hard. You have to go against sometimes your society and your country and your culture and the ideas that are there. And I told my kids, I want you to be rebels in a good way. Rebels for Jesus Christ. Rebels against abortion, against contraception, against all of the evils of the world. And you know, my kids took me up on that because our family is a rebel family. I view myself now as being part of an under, uh, like a, what, what do you call it, like a secret club. Our family's a secret club. Nobody else can join it. It's just us. We have another secret club called the church. We're part of that too. But our family is a secret club that we're going to stand for holiness even in an unholy world. And I want my kids to learn that. And you know what my son did when he got his first car? When he was 16, he'd been saving his money since he was eight years old to buy his own car. And when he was 16, we took him down and he bought a car with the money he'd been saving all his life as a little boy. And he had five friends. And these five boys with my son made a pledge together. They made a pledge that they were going to stay virgins until married. And they did. In America, that's a big deal because if you don't go around having sex, there's something wrong with you. You're viewed as being something wrong with you if you don't go around having sex with people before marriage. But my son said, no, I'm going to be a rebel. I'm going to stand for Jesus Christ and for morality. And all of my kids asked me to give them a chastity ring. Do you know what a chastity ring is? You have that here? It's a ring that they put on their hand. I bought it for them. And they, we take them to the priest at church and they make a pledge before Mother and I and before the priest and God that they will remain virgins until they are married. And my son said, I'm going to be a rebel. And he got five friends in the parish and they made a club and they were all going to stick together. And they had something that when they were out walking around, they had what they called a babe alert. A babe is a beautiful girl, right? It was a babe alert. Whenever they were walking and they saw a girl come with not enough clothes on, where usually boys would look, they said, babe alert, babe alert, and they'd all look the other way. <laughs> they said, we're going to keep our eyes holy. We're going to only look at things that are holy. We're not going to look upon a girl to lust after her. 
So they're walking along, and I'm like, babe alert, babe alert, and they'd all look the other way. And my son went with his new car, and he bought big pieces of plywood, and he painted signs on them against abortion. And they came home, and they said, Dad. Oh, and when, they, and then when the people were yelling, of course, they rolled down the windows and said, Save the babies. God loves you too. And they had, he came home and said, Dad, we had so much fun. We were out there present, preaching the gospel about pro-life and everybody hated us and we just told them, God loves you too, save the babies. He said, we had so much fun we couldn't believe it because they were rebels, rebels for Jesus. I think every family, I think every family should view themselves as rebels for Jesus. A secret society Part of the Catholic Church, which is another secret society. We're becoming fewer and fewer in the world. You just look at what's happening with all of, all of uh, ISIS and all the Muslims and so on. Christians are being persecuted everywhere by communists in China and North Korea. They're being persecuted by all over the world now. Even the United States and here, Christians are persecuted. So we are becoming, the Catholic Church is becoming this big club. And in a way, we have to be a family of rebels that is going to serve Jesus Christ no matter what. Stand up for him. And I can tell you that in, in the Christian life, there is nothing more rewarding than for a husband and a wife to love each other for a lifetime and to raise a family for Jesus and to put Jesus first in your life. God bless you. May you be successful at it. When you're not, pray and go to confession and start over again. Thank you very much. God bless you.